Hello, my name is Emily Hamilton. For those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the pastors here at CPC. And since September, I have been regularly meeting with a small group of folks in our church community here that are studying and asking questions and praying together about how their faith makes a difference in their work and vocations. Um, you know, I'm a pastor, so it's like a little more obvious for me <laughs> how that makes a difference. But for a lot of us, I think we sometimes wrestle with how does the faith that we practice in here make a difference in all the places that we spend our time out there. And in one of the videos of about the studies that we've been doing together, we have come across a story of a guy who I want to tell you about today, whose story really has touched me. His name is Vincent Kong. This is him. Vincent is a Christian. He lives in Hong Kong. And he uh, is, at the time when he was telling the story, he was an inspector going into factories in mainland China on behalf of Western businesses and buyers and clients. And it was his job to go in and inspect the environmental conditions and the working conditions in these factories and then report on them back to the buyers so that the buyers could both kind of leverage a little bit of pressure to make sure that the factories were operating in the kind of compliance and company standards that they wanted to be buying, uh, the kinds of practices that they wanted to be buying from in their factories. So um, while Vincent is at this job, he encounters a lot of hard things. He uncovers a lot of injustice. He found labor law violations, he found factories paying below minimum wage, not paying overtime, even using child labor. And so both out of his Christian commitment and his responsibility for his job, he tried to bring attention to these problems. Um, but he kept finding that the factory owners would blow him off. It seemed like the reports that he was writing never were read. And he even wrestled with like whether or not to be a, like an actual whistleblower, but he had signed an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. And so he really felt stuck. He kept doing what he could, bringing up the issues, writing the truth, but for years he felt like nothing changed. And after a while, it really wore him out. He said, I knew God would do something, but I didn't know what. In my work, I began to feel hopeless, and I struggled to find any meaning. And he talks about how he started to think, you know, either I just need to quit doing this because nothing I do makes a difference. I don't know why I'm trying. Or just maybe, maybe something about my faith could help sustain me in this really hard place to keep trying and try to be faithful. I'll come back to Vincent's story later, but for now, I want to point out that question that he's asking. One of the questions that this small group I'm a part of sometimes asks, a question that I think lingers for a lot of us, which is this, in, in a complex and broken world, do attempts to live out the way of Jesus really get us anywhere? in a world that values productivity and efficiency and where the only thing that seems to matter, the only metrics that make a difference are how many likes we get on a post. Do the slow habits of walking in step with the spirit of Jesus really take us anywhere? Throughout Lent, we've been studying what the Apostle Paul wrote in a letter to the Galatian Christians. And his letter has one really clear message. In Christ, you have been set free. First, you are set free from the power of sin, and you are set free from needing anything other than Jesus to get into God's family. But second, you're also free for life in the Spirit. You are freed and empowered to actively participate in the work of the Spirit here and now. So you're freed from and you're freed for. But in the background of our passage this morning, you can almost hear that the Galatian Christians are probably asking something really similar to Vincent's question here. Sure, Paul, we're free, but things don't like magically change overnight. Sometimes this Jesus way is really hard, feels costly and counterintuitive, and it doesn't match up with the things that the world says are valuable. Is it really better for us to try to live in step with the Spirit and not just for ourselves? 
So to hear Paul's answer, I'm going to invite you to grab a Bible from a pew rack in front of you. You can follow along on the screens. In, your bi- in the Bibles in the pews, it's page 1663, 1663. And we're almost at the end of Galatians in chapter 6, verses 7 to 10. Galatians 6, 7 to 10, which say this. I hear lots of rustling still, so. All right, it says this. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So first, Paul just has a warning here. Don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. That word mock here uh, means something like the way like a kid on a playground would be like, nya, nya, you can't catch me. And Paul knows that the Galatian Christians are encountering lots of mocking voices, both from the culture around them and probably in their own heads as they're trying out this Jesus way of life. Because people thought Christians were like weirdos at best and dangerous at worst, crossing ethnic barriers, saying they're part of a new family, refusing to sacrifice to the gods and go to the temples. And Paul's really clear. Those voices that devalue your new life in Christ and try to convince you it's not worth it, they're lying to you. And they're not going to get the last word. So don't kid yourself. You can refuse to live aligned with the freedom you've been given in Christ, but you do so to your own peril. Next, he says, a person reaps what they sow, or in other words, what you do today does in fact matter for the future. Now, if you put yourself back in Paul's time before modern farming equipment, and not like I'm an expert here, but I think that sowing a field probably took a really long time. Um, It could probably be a very long, slow, repetitive process. You have to prep the soil, you have to form the rows, you have to place the seeds, cover the seeds, collect water, water your seeds, repeat as necessary, and then wait. And in our fast-paced, results-based lives and work, I think a lot of us actually think that the actions we take are kind of like coins in a vending machine, like insert cash or select payment type. And we get the product right away, take it home. But when Paul says you reap what you sow, he is definitely wanting us to think with a longer time frame about how the everyday habits and attitudes that we engage are like the slow work of planting seeds that will influence the future, even if it takes time to see how. And this slow sowing and reaping can go one of two ways. On the one hand, Paul says, whoever sows to the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Now, you'll remember maybe that when Paul uses that word flesh, he doesn't really mean our physical bodies. He uses the word flesh as a label to describe our fallen human nature that is hostile to God. The parts of our humanity, both as individuals and communities, that remain untransformed still by the Spirit, which often ends up looking like a very self-centered set of choices or way of life. And he's like, when you plant seeds, in the soil of your untransformed self. And when it is you, rather than the Spirit of God in you at the head of your life, when you plow and plant and water seeds every day in that soil, you may not see it right away, but that is a recipe for destruction. 
The factory owners that Vincent confronted were so convinced of sowing in the soil of their own bottom line that it reaped destruction in the lives of the factory workers. The comparisons that you rehearse over and over again as you scroll through your feed and obsess about your likes, you're sowing in the soil of needing others to tell you that you're lovable and worthy. And in the end, you just reap more jealousy and anxiety. The cyclical outbursts of rage that you have to your family, you're you're sowing in the soil of self-protection and control, but over time, it just reaps more destructive fear and isolation. The greed and the materialism that you justify with all the things you need You're sowing in the soil of self-preservation and self-comfort. And in the end, you just reap more dissatisfaction while the needs of the poor go unmet. It's so counterintuitive, but it's often our attempts at self-validation and self-preservation and self-security that end up having the exact opposite result. So don't be deceived. Controlling our lives at any cost ends up being the way of destruction. But there is another way it can go. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And when Paul uses that phrase, eternal life, he means something a little bit bigger and a little bit already than just the thought of making it to heaven when we die. He means that when we live in the Spirit, the life of the kingdom of God has already started to break into the present order of things. And that as we increasingly live our lives centered not on ourselves, but centered on the Spirit, somehow we get to participate in that eternal life of God's kingdom becoming more visible and more tangible here and now. Yes, eternal life for our future is assured for us simply on the basis of God's grace, apart from our ability to earn it. And at the same time, starting now, our feet have been definitively placed on new soil in the territory of the Spirit. And as we are transformed by that Spirit, we have a real part to play joining with God in the slow, repetitive, habitual work of sowing good seeds into the new creation soil that will bear fruit of life that lasts. So what does that mean? It means that on this soil, the Spirit assures me that I have been chosen by God as his child, Therefore, I don't have to give in to jealousy and depend on external validation. Instead, when I'm secure in my identity in Christ, I can sow seeds of kindness and hospitality as I engage others. On this new soil, I've been shown grace beyond compare. Therefore, I'm not entitled to treat others with rage and contempt when they offend me. Instead, I can love my enemies, and I can sow seeds of grace that build bridges and heal wounds. On this new soil, I'm promised an inheritance more precious than gold. Therefore, I don't have to preserve my life through my stuff. Instead, I can sow seeds of generosity and care for others. On this new soil, Vincent finally remembered that God is going to be trustworthy to fulfill his promise of justice to the poor. And so therefore, he did not have to despair. Instead, he could confidently sow seeds of faithfulness and truth, even in small things, writing his reports, praying at times with factory workers who felt too overwhelmed to make changes, He says, I realized I lived in the kingdom of God, and that kingdom comes, but has not yet fully come. 
So even if I didn't see immediate changes, I knew God would someday make things different. And actually, years later, Vincent uh, went back to one of the worst factories that he had reported on, and he realized that finally, some of those reports he had been writing were starting to make a difference for those workers there. And even in a small way, the eternal life of God's kingdom was breaking through in that place. And so for the Galatians wondering, is sowing to the Spirit really worth it? And for us who question if the often hidden and slow ways of the Spirit really get us anywhere, and for everyone who's hearing those mocking voices taunting us with the question, can this soil really produce anything good? To all of these, Paul gives a big, loud yes. Yes, it is worth it. Yes, we are going somewhere here. Yes, this soil is good. Your own life and the redemption that God has started in it is evidence that the harvest of eternal life is starting to break through. Therefore, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, God's perfect, complete time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You may not see it right away. You may sow the seeds for years but in the scheme of eternity, in the soil of what God's spirit is doing, it will bear fruit. And that means that the old math of the flesh at the center of your life doesn't have to be the way it is anymore. So do good, Paul says, at every opportunity to every person you can because your good deeds are flowing from the transformation you've experienced in the spirit and they're being planted in new creation soil. A few years ago, during Holy Week, I watched this gorgeous movie called A Hidden Life. And the movie follows, uh, it's a true story. The movie follows the story of this man, this is a shot from the film, a man named Franz I'm going to try to say it right, Franz Jägerstetter. And Franz is an Austrian farmer. He's a father and husband from a small village in the 1930s and 40s. And Franz is just like the epitome of an ordinary guy who like nobody should have ever heard about. But then Nazi Germany annexes Austria, begins conscripting Austrian men to fight for the Third Reich. And all of a sudden, Franz, who has been a farmer and sown literal seeds his whole life, is faced with what it means to sow seeds to the Spirit. And based on his Christian convictions, Franz refuses to swear an oath to Hitler. He refuses to take up arms for Germany. He is eventually imprisoned for his resistance. And in 1943, at the age of 36, he is executed. And um, it's easy to think of people like Franz, essentially martyrs. It's easy to think of them as people that must be like super spiritual, kind of like spiritual superheroes. Um, but Franz is not that. And in fact, it's, it's the ordinariness of his own life that seems to be part of the reason that he struggles so much with whether or not it's worth it to resist. Throughout the film, the biggest temptation he faces is not, mm, should I swear an oath to Hitler? The temptation is, what if my resistance makes no difference? He knows that his life and his death will be hidden and he hears that mocking message from his friends, from his community, from the prison guards. No one will know about you. No one will care that you did this. Even his priest comes to him and says, just compromise, man. It's not worth it. But Franz as a follower of the crucified and risen Messiah, knows that his resistance, even in hiddenness, is a form of faithfulness sown in the soil of new creation. And while it may not be immediate, it will bear fruit. From prison, he wrote, just as the man who thinks only of this world does everything possible to make life here easier and better, so must we Christians convince ourselves that our struggle is for the eternal kingdom. And Franz discovers that when you give up sowing to the flesh at any cost, you discover on the other side the eternal life of God's kingdom, where death is not the end. 
Um, like I said, I first watched this film during Holy Week a few years ago, and it is striking how Franz's life and death become a window into Jesus' own life and death in the movie. When Jesus was wrongly convicted and sentenced to death on a Roman torture device, mockers taunted him, saying, if you're so powerful, why don't you save yourself? And at that moment, it looked like none of it mattered. It looked like complete failure. But it didn't stay that way. And that's the reason that Paul says we can sow to the Spirit with the confidence that we will reap a harvest of eternal life. Because Jesus has gone first, he has gone ahead of us, and because he has done that, we are set free by him. And he, our crucified and risen Lord, Hebrew says, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. And because he has done that, we can be assured that when we sow to the Spirit here and now, when we crucify our flesh, when we practice habits of faithfulness, when we do good to all people, even if it feels hidden, even if it feels small, we are taking part in the eternal life of the new creation that has already started breaking into the present. And it matters. It matters. And so in those moments when we do grow weary, one of the places that we can be renewed is in this meal. In the moments when our flesh feels like it is too strong to overcome, we can come back to this table and eat and be nourished. In the moments when the mocking voices feel like they are the loudest thing and tempt us to despair, we can come back here and remember what Jesus' voice sounds like. And when the hope of eternal life feels like it is just pie in the sky, too far away, we can come back to this meal and we can remember that it is a foretaste of the heavenly banquet that we are going to share with God and all his people in new bodies and a new creation in a place where sorrow and sighing will be no more. And so it was a few days after Palm Sunday on a Thursday that Jesus had a meal with his disciples and later that night he would be betrayed and everything would seem just about lost. But even so, in that moment, Jesus with his friends, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and he gave it to them and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And so friends, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life until he comes again. As the servers come forward, ushers will dismiss you by row to come to a communion station. Here at CPC, we invite you to take a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup. There's also gluten-free elements at each station. And we invite you to come. All who seek to follow after Jesus are welcome at this meal. And these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God.